Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome, and thanks for joining us. Uh, it's the 2023 New Can webinar series today, and we'll be highlighting monitoring priorities for the Northeast. This is our ninth webinar in this series, and the theme today is user needs and products. With the assistance of this series and our presenters today, the NECAN Steering Committee will be working on the development of a regional monitoring plan for ocean acidification. And the webinars will serve as a resource for them as the plan comes together. Uh, updates on this series are shared through our mailing list and on our website. So be sure to check out our website and we have the rest of the full schedule on there, which should be updated with some new webinars uh, quite soon. At the conclusion of presentations today, the steering committee will be asking our panel some questions, and then we're going to open it up for a more general Q&A from the wider audience. During that Q&A session, please feel free to use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen, or you can submit questions and comments in the chat, which I will be monitoring. First up, we're going to hear from Anne Giblin. Anne is a senior scientist and director of the Ecosystems Center. Anne's major research interest has been on the cycling of elements in the environment, especially the biogeochemistry of nitrogen, sulfur, iron, and phosphorus. The major theme of her research has been to examine how sediment processes either ameliorate or augment the effects of anthropogenic inputs of elements to ecosystems. Much of her research is examining how increased nitrogen inputs, hydrologic disturbances, and sea level rise are altering nitrogen and carbon carbon cycling and estuaries in the Plum Island Marsh system, north of Boston. She also investigates and controls on and investigates the controls on nitrogen removal pathways in places ranging from New England, continental shelf, to the Arctic Lakes on the north slope of Alaska. Uh, thank you for presenting today, Anne, and please feel free to share your screen. Thanks a lot, Austin. Uh, sorry for sending you so much verbiage in the <laughs> intro. I didn't uh, edit that one very well. Um, okay. Um, let's see if I can get that off there. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, everybody. Um, I know this particular session is called User Needs and Products. Um, I'm going to try to give you two perspectives. One is a perspective from the Mass Governor's Commission on Ocean Acidification. Um, which I was a, a member of um, a couple of years ago, and then add some additional thoughts that are from my perspective as a marine and estuarine biogeochemist. And I know in terms of monitoring, we all are hoping for that magic tricorder that will give us all the information we need. Um, but I'm going to try to interject some, maybe some hopeful uh, news that I, I think that we're not too far away from being able to collect most of the information we need. So the report on ocean acidification um, looked at things both offshore and from the point of view of coastal waters, which is where certainly a lot of the aquaculture and shell fishing takes place, as well as recreational fisheries. Um, I think last week, if you heard the um, presentation by Grace, and later you're going to hear a presentation by Jan, it's going to talk a little bit more about open waters. So I'm going to sort of limit myself to coastal waters in this presentation. So the commission had a series of recommendations. There were nine in all. And of course, one of those was to improve acidification monitoring along the coastline. But if you look at those recommendations in a little more detail, you realize that really four of those recommendations probably require some degree of monitoring, um, certainly to develop the best practices for shell fishing. And um, we need to know a lot more about ocean acidification on short time scales or on longer time scales um, on fairly small spatial scales. Um, as I hope I'll convince you by the end of today, one of the conclusions of the commission was that nutrients are a severe issue for acidification in coastal waters. So we'll need to know more about nutrient pollution and be able to monitor nutrient inputs more effectively than we can now. So, You've been listening to these talks, you know very well that to really fully calculate um, all of the parameters we need for things like shellfish, we use something called aragonite, aragonite saturation, whether or not aragonite will be laid down or will be dissolved. And to do that, we need to know quite a bit about the carbonate cycle. We need to know at least two parameters, alkalinity, pH, 
total dissolved inorganic carbon, or PCO2. And once we have two of those, we can calculate any of the other two, and we can also calculate aragonite, aragonite saturation. The conclusion of the commission was that most monitoring programs lack the ability to measure aragonite saturation. Um, and that there needs to be some way to expand our ability to make this calculation for shell fishing. And they recommended a broad sensitive monitoring system that will enable sensitive industries like the shellfish industry to understand and react to ocean acidification, um, respond on a short time for pH changes along the mass coastline, um, be tuned to allow shell fishing operations to adjust their operation, and they also recommended that a gap analysis be conducted to determine what extent we need to do more monitoring, which I think is the task that, that you all are trying to do um, and also come up with some better ideas and some, and some cost estimates. So as I said, I'm gonna stick with near shore waters and that's because the processes leading to ocean acidification are a little bit different in the offshore than they are in the near shore. Certainly atmospheric CO2 matters, but in the near shore, salinity and internal processes, especially the, the balance of respiration and photosynthesis really tend to dominate um, the landscape. So I'm gonna to stick to near shore systems. Here's some data that we put in um, the report. Uh, it's a little bit of a complicated figure, but if you look on the left-hand side, what you'll see is, um, an annual cycle of pH, the solid line with the white circles shows you how pH varies over the year. You see it reaches a minimum sort of in late summer there. The gray envelope is the variation that is seen and the, the solid line with the bars going horizontally is sort of how much deviation you see during that month. So in August, um, in this particular site, the pH varied from eight to as low as 7.2. At the same time, right below that, you see how the oxygen concentrations vary, and they varied from about 10 to down below 3. And again, we see the most acidic conditions and the most variability in these estuaries in the summer. The right-hand graphs break it down on a sort of number of hours of the day, uh, which could indicate how much stress an organism would be under. Uh, we see that during the summer months, there's usually at least several hours where the pH is below 7.5, and the majority of the day, the pH is below 7.8 during the summer. Similarly, during that period, we have low oxygen conditions frequently, and for the majority of the day, we have um, oxygen conditions below about 8. So the point is when we're thinking about shellfish, we've got a double stress here. We've got an oxygen stress as well as a pH stress. I wanna talk a little bit more about nutrients using an example from Laquite Bay. Um, that's on Cape Cod where the little arrow is. Laquite Bay is sort of a wonderful system because it has different areas of the, of the complex that are drained by different um, degrees of development. So the Child's River there um, is the highest loaded. I don't know how well you can see that peninsula there, but these are very dense housing developments. Sage Lot Pond uh, is undeveloped and sort of the, the east side of the bay there is, is intermediate development. So the Wakoit Bay Estuarine Research Reserves for a long time now has monitored this system with um, SONS. They measure oxygen, temperature, salinity, and pH regularly. Um, throughout, pretty much throughout the year, except during the, the frozen months. So here's just a couple of days data to start at the head of the bay. And what you can see is what you sort of got a flavor from, from that previous graph, which is on a daily basis, there's very large swings in oxygen. We go super saturated due to high productivity some days. Um, at night or during cloudy periods, the oxygen sags down uh, as low as two. If we now compare these three areas, we have Sage Lot Pond, which was the least developed, the head of the bay, which was intermediate, and Child's River, which is the most development. And we see a pretty clear pattern. During the summer, we see oxygen concentrations tend to sag, uh, especially at night. 
a little bit more with the more development. And then when we get into the most heavily developed areas, we see very, very low oxygen concentrations for days on end um, during the summer. So how does this relate to pH? If we compare the pH values of these two, of just the two extreme sites, we see Sage Lot Pond, which shows smaller oxygen swings, seldom goes below 7.5 whereas the Child's River has many um, instances where the pH gets down uh, as low as seven. So the more eutrophic system is having more oxygen depletion, which because when you deplete the oxygen, you produce carbon dioxide for respiration is driving the pH down. So I'm gonna um, go back from these sort of coastal embayments that don't have a lot of wetlands to them to talk about a wetland system, which is a little bit more complicated. Um, this is some data from Plum Island Sound and the um, estuaries, Parker, Rowley, and Ipswich. And this is part of the long-term ecological research site, which is up there. So if we look at one of these estuaries, this is the Parker River Estuary, and we go along, we start at the dam and we go all the way down to the ocean. It's about 25 kilometers. Um, depending upon the season, we have a very different salinity structure in this estuary. Um, in the spring, when there's a fair amount of discharge, it can be fresh for the first five kilometers. Um, and then the salinity goes up to oceanic values um, when we reach the mouth. That tends to change during the summer. And last summer when we had that drought, you can see we had saline conditions almost all the way to the dam. So very, very different salinity conditions. If we do a transect in a single day along, these, um, along this system, we do dawn dusk transects. What you see is that even though we didn't see a salinity change from dawn to dusk, we see very large oxygen changes. Here's what we see at dawn, very low oxygen with a, a big sag here at the intermediate salinities with oxygen going back up and similarly at dusk. So we have this area of, of low oxygen. And if we sort of plot that now against space, what we see is here's the salinity that's freshest up near the dam and then gets more saline. But the lowest oxygen conditions are um, not in the freshest water part, which um, they're somewhat in what we call the oligo oligohaline section where the river is fairly small, it's not very salty, and it's totally surrounded by wetlands. If we compare the two sites now up in the up in the Parker River at the middle bridge and down here near the sound, we have numbers of years of data where we can look at the oxygen concentration. Again, these seasonal swings where oxygen goes lower in the summer. But at the Yacht Club, we don't see a lot of uh, very low oxygen events. Whereas if we get up to the Middle Road Bridge, oh, sorry, I, I'm showing you the opposite here. Um, we don't see a lot of low oxygen events, but we get the Middle Road Bridge. We do see oxygens getting, getting low fairly frequently. This is just calculations to try to pull out the photosynthesis and respiration from this data. Um, this is unpublished data from Annette Hines and company. So I'm not gonna go through these calculations, but the important thing is we have a very, very metabolic system. So what that leads to is a situation where um, we have aragonite undersaturation, grossly undersaturated through the upper and the middle part of the estuary upper estuary being driven by low salinity, middle estuary being driven more by um, situations of high metabolic activity. Once we get into the more saline parts of the estuary, in spite of the fact this is a very um, salt marsh dominated system, we usually see uh, reasonable aragonite saturation values. So, um, a number of people, including Chris, Chris Hunt, who's on this call, are trying to look at the exact relationship between alkalinity, uh, salinity, pH, and all those parameters. The reason is in these very wetland-dominated systems, sulfate reduction in the sediments produces alkalinity, and that can lead to an alkalinity export. 
We can have periods of time when those sediment sulfides are being oxidized and produce acid and that can be exported. And we know that our organic alkalinity and organic acids can be produced and they have somewhat of an unknown role. So all these processes are apt to be most important in wetland dominated estuaries. But at the end of the day, I think the question comes down to whether or not they're so important that we can't understand the system without uh, measuring them by themselves. So, so I'm gonna argue for most systems, we can get by with a little bit less information. I'm gonna show you a study of five um, systems that was done by um, Jenny Ruban and collaborators. And they looked at five separate estuaries over a course of a year to determine the impact of nutrient on ocean acidification. So this is a graph of what's changing the aragonite saturation, either moving it more negative or more positive. Um, the data is color coded by temperature and this axis is apparent oxygen utilization. And what apparent oxygen utilization is, is a way to judge how much respiration has happened you calculate what the oxygen content should have been at saturation given that temperature and salinity and you look to see what it was and you assume that that difference was due to respiration. And if it is, the more respiration you have, the more CO2 you produce. So what you see here is a lot of values down in the negative category, um, tends to be more negative, at higher temperatures, less at colder temperatures. Um, but you see all those very negative values corresponding to oxygen use, um, a high AOU. And then you see some cases where oxygen is being produced during the day by photosynthesis. That of course takes carbon dioxide out of the water and leads to a, um, a positive change in the pH. So when they sort of dissected all this data from these five systems, they looked at several factors. Um, here's the aragonite saturation versus salinity. And what you see here is that if you predict what the aragonite saturation should be, assuming a mixing curve between fresh water and salt water, you predict to be along this line and you tend to be below this line. And that is predicted by the degree of oxygen utilization. Similarly, I'll just skip to the pH here. Here's what you'd expect to see with conservative mixing for the pH across this salinity gradient. And what you see is a lot of uh, very acidic values corresponding to very high amounts of oxygen utilization and positive values associated with oxygen production. Interestingly enough, they were able to, even on a, on a seasonal basis, on a very big way, calculate this change in the aragonite saturation against a nitrogen loading um, estimate for these estuaries. And while it's not a perfect relationship, you can see a very strong trend there with the more nitrogen enriched the estuary is, the more negative that that has, effect that has on aragonite, aragonite saturation. So they went on to calculate how these estuaries um, could be made less acidic if we had lower nitrogen loads based upon this model. Um, and if you look at the ones that are more heavily loaded, this is the most heavily loaded one. You can see this is the current value for aragonite saturation. If the estuary was able to achieve its um, total maximum daily limit, it would be fair it would be greatly improved. And if there was no nitrogen limit, it, it would actually be improved even more. So the implications for modeling, I think, are that DO, dissolved oxygen, or AOU, depending upon how you want to use it, pH, salinity, and temperature can fairly successfully predict aragonite saturation in, in most coastal embayments and estuaries. The role of alkalinity production and consumption due to sulfate reduction, sulfide oxidation, and organic acids is being examined. Um, it might be important, it might be very important in some systems, but these might be less common and it might be limited to um, estuaries with very large ratios of salt marsh to estuary. 
and fairly reduced flushing. So that means that we have the monitoring tools mostly on hand. Um, with SANS, we can get good continuous data. Uh, many places have these SANS now. They're all up and down the coast. Um, not all of them have pH, which of course is absolutely critical, but if this was added on, and then that was supplemented with more detailed carbon chemistry on various spatial and time scales, um, I think we'd have a, a really pretty robust system that would be useful for both the shellfish industry and for understanding what's going on. And finally, um, there are, in terms of organic alkalinity, there are newer signs that measure uh, dissolved organic matter, but more work's gonna have to be done on that to see if this data is gonna be useful in a um, AO context. So I think I'll, I'll stop there. Um, and I think we wanna go on first before questions. Is that right, Austin? Yes, that's perfectly right, Janet. Uh, we are going to do all the presentations and big combined question period at the end. Thank you so much for that presentation. That was amazing. Uh, up next, we are going to hear from Janet Nye. Janet is a quantitative fish fisheries ecologist. She uses lab and field data to develop population ecosystem models that can be used in ecosystem-based fisheries management. She was a faculty member at Stony Brook University from 2012 to 2020, before moving to the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. She is based at the Institute of Marine Sciences in Moorhead University, North Carolina, but continues to monitor and develop indicators for the New York fight. Please uh, share your screen, Janet, and I look forward to your presentation. Great, thank you. Um, thanks for having me, and I um, want to emphasize, I guess, throughout my talk that um, we, uh, meaning me and about four or five other PIs, are uh, conducting an ecosystem monitoring program in the New York Bite, and it's funded by the New York State DEC. So we're really grateful for them for funding this big, um, I think, uh, progressive project. Um, <clears throat> so ocean acidification and monitoring carbonate chemistry in the coastal ocean is just a part of that. And I want to recognize my um, OA team, um, Dr. Boshan Chen, who's a research associate in, at Stony Brook, Tyler Mentz, who's a technician, and Teresa Schwimmer, who's a recent uh, PhD graduate from Stony Brook University, who's going to continue um, doing a postdoc at MACAN, looking at indicators of ocean acidification in the Mid-Atlantic. <clears throat> and just to give you a little bit of history, um, in 2012, uh, New York had a workshop that identified needs for the New York ocean ecosystem. Um, the top things that were prioritized were was an integrated ocean monitoring program and to develop indicators of ecosystem health. And at that time, there wasn't really a mention of uh, carbonate chemistry ocean acidification, but certainly climate change was on um, everyone's mind. Um, and then New York uh, DEC did uh, several workshops um, <clears throat> after that. And then the New York State Legislator, Le Legislature passed the um, OA Task Force Bill. So this formed um, an OA Task Force. To, and that really um, focused uh, a little bit more on carbonate chemistry. Um, and then in 2017, as a result of a lot of this, uh, New York DEC released the New York Ocean Action Plan. And at the same time, they funded several projects. Um, and one of them was our project to monitor the coastal ocean. <clears throat> and just, um, uh, we, we did get a glider with that um, that funding, but you know, mostly just to monitor the physical oceanography of, this, of the system. In you, 2019, you want to share your slides right now? Oh, are they not Sorry, showing? I can't see anything. <laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> Let me try again. Maybe I didn't press the share button. Now we see them. Uh, thank now you. Now you see them? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, 
Okay, so we're, yeah, I was talking about the glider. We have a glider. And in 2019, we, you know, when we planned this, we didn't know that there would be a pH sensor, but now we have a pH sensor on the Stony Brook glider working with Grace Abbott at Rutgers and the Rutgers crew. Um, and then in, in 2023, we purchased an additional glider and two sea foxes to deploy in the coastal ocean. Um, this is the New York bite. Um, my New Jersey colleagues would consider part of this the, the New Jersey bite, but um, we work, as I said, closely with uh, the folks at Rutgers on monitoring this part of the ocean. Uh, this is sort of, we did an assessment of the uh, instrument and monitoring that was done prior to us uh, getting this funding in 2017. Um, and so within the New York bite, there wasn't, you know, there were a few buoys in this Oleander ship of opportunity. Um, and when we looked more closely at the carbonate chemistry, um, thank you to the Marco web portal and maps for, for being able to, you know, quickly assess all this, but um, there was very little uh, carbonate chemistry at all in the New York bite, you know, really the ECOA cruises just got the sort of boundaries of the New York bite region. And then there's also some um, data from the Northeast Fishery Science Center's um, cruises. So this was the information that we went on to plan our carbonate chemistry monitoring. Um, and we decided to primarily do shipboard monitoring. Um, this is the RV Seawolf, which is, as you can tell, a converted commercial fishing vessel. Um, and it's mostly been used to monitor fish populations. Um, but as you'll see, we put a scientific seawater system and are you know, now using this to, for carbonate chemistry. Um, and then we, do, we planned four seasonal cruises on roughly six transects. We have seven. Um, these were the optimal widths for marine, monitor, marine mammal monitoring. And so we didn't really know, you know, before we started this project, like how long it was going to take to do the the full area of the New York bite. And um, each one of these black spots is, a, of course, a CTD station. So this is where we began. And I want to emphasize that we are monitoring the pelagic ecosystem. We kind of um, looked at what data was available and decided not to focus on the benthic system as much. And um, we really want to go from the physical and chemical oceanography to zooplankton. We run acoustics the entire time when we're doing these transects. And we started out monitoring the marine mammal. So as the boat was um, cruising along in the day, we would monitor marine mammal populations. <clears throat> We've since um, dropped the marine mammal um, part of this because it just took, we, we weren't on a marine mammal ops for that for long enough to really get a good abundance estimates of, of marine mammals. And we switched to, to seabirds on a separate platform. Um, so we were funded in 2017, um, and then we went on our first cruise in 2018, and so it was quite a race to get this um, seawater system um, on the boat in that amount of time, and so I'm pretty proud that we did that. Um, but we have a general oceanics PO2 sensor um, on the boat, and we also have, you know, um, temperature, salinity, fluorescent CDOM turbidity. And then after the 2018 cruise, we were able to add a sunburst pH sensor and a dissolved oxygen sensor. Um, but the main, you know, I think an important part for the carbonate chemistry was the CTD. This is not our CTD. <laughs> we don't have that many Niskin bottles, but um, we have a glass probe pH sensor on that. And of course we get temperature salinity pressure um, as well as um, discrete water samples for carbonate chemistry. And this gives you a sense of our cruise track. So um, this was the first cruise track that we took and we, you know, sometimes come off of the, would come off of the transects to do marine mammal um, observations, but we get, um, you know, the Long Island Sound surface waters and then, you know, this, this area. Um, this is some data from our first cruise. So we knew right away and, and probably no big surprise that um, 
you know, we had very different dynamics, regions of different carbonate chemistry dynamics within this area. Obviously, the Long Island Sound, which we're not really, it's not really part of our monitoring program, but we we start the seawater system when we leave the Port Jefferson port. Um, so we get um, some PCO2 data here, and we also um, do some discrete water samples near the buoy uh, that the Long Island Sound program is, is um, running. Um, and then we also, you know, have some high, we have high CO2 values here, but also um, in what we call the Hudson River plume, as well as some other um, areas near the inlet and um, closer to shore. And then obviously uh, further offshore, we have higher salinities and more influence of the of the Gulf Stream and um, different dynamics there. <clears throat> and um, this is some data from July of 2019. And what you see, and these are the transects um, for which we have um, CTD casts and the discrete um, bottle samples is that really there, the east to west variability is relatively low. Um, and it's really this inshore to offshore variability that um, is more important. And then of course the low aragonite areas are found at depth and they're associated with the cold pool. We've done some analysis to look at how you know, much they overlap. So it's not a, you know, it doesn't perfectly overlap and we're looking into the, those dynamics, but um, you know, we know this area is, um, going to be the areas that may be problematic for shellfish and other marine organisms. Um, and so I should say, you know, these are aragonite values that are um, calculated from our discrete water samples where we measure TA and DIC, and then we've been able um, some pH um, samples in, in recent times. Um, in terms of seasonality, um, winter it has the lowest variability. Fall has the, the most variability, but that may be because we just don't, um, we often get blown out in the fall. So we we often just do one or two transects. And so that may be why our, our variability is as high for aragonite. Um, and as was always the plan in working with DEC, um, after the first few years of collecting data, we kind of reevaluated and have changed our sampling protocol. So um, now we just do four transects. Um, this saves us a lot of time. It allows us to um, spend more time at each station to get, um, I hope this, uh, this cruise we have upcoming in July will collect some nutrient data. Um, and we'll just do four transects. And then also what we are doing is adding some bottom mounted mooring because you know you saw that large area that had lower aragonite. We feel like it's important to capture those dynamics a little bit better. So we are gonna put our CFOX sensor, uh, CFOX sensor here um, near an artificial reef. So it'd be protected, but, and also near um, one of our CTD stations and the wind energy area. And then we'll also have some other, um, they won't have carbonate chemistry on them, but they'll have um, hydrography. And these two will have an echo sounder. Um, this is some, some analysis that Boshan Chen has been able to do now that we have the full feet seasonal cycle of 2019. I should say 2020 and 2021 um, COVID interrupted. So this is the, the full seasonal, for first seasonal cycle that we have to look at. Um, and, um, you know, obviously you can see the um, typical seasonal dynamics that you would imagine, but Boshan looked at the different um, areas. So this is area one, two, and three. And, um, He's working on a paper to look at, you know, how temperature and other factors influence those, those um, dynamics and CO2 flux. So in the winter, um, we have more flux of CO2 into the ocean. It's cold. And then in the spring, it's a little, you know, more variable. Um, and then in the summer, we have actually 
CO2 flux out of the ocean. So the, the New York bite is a source of, of CO2 to the atmosphere. And um, again, this, this kind of represents the, the um, poor sampling that we get on the, the shipboard ops for the fall, but it, in um, the New York bite, it's a net flux of CO2 in the, in the ocean. So this has important um, implications for ocean acidification. Um, this is some of the pH glider data that we've had since 2019. I think this is the summer of 2022. And um, this is the, you're probably more interested in this uh, low pH values down here. So this would be the, um, some low pH values at the bottom, similar to what we see, but you can just see that there's a little bit more um, resolution with the, with the glider. Um, but, you know, as I said, this is an ecosystem monitoring program. So we uh, were interested in developing indicators from day one from all of these data. Uh, and so I'll take you back to these uh, figures that I showed you uh, for aragonite saturation um, at the bottom. And so sort of my, when we started out, my idea was, you know, we would just simply in, in air quotes, um, draw a circle around this low aragonite area and calculate that volume and say, okay, in this year, in the season, there was, you know, this much um, poor habitat uh, for whatever species of interest um, you wanted to look at. And actually that, that um, was a comment that DEC made to us you know, we would report these pH and aragonite values to them and they would say, okay, but you can you translate that into, you know, some ecological terms, um, especially that relate to um, fisheries management. And so Teresa Schwimmer did um, a lot of digging into the uh, primary literature and looked at all those experiments that have been ongoing on different organisms to look at, okay, what are the thresholds for different species? Um, for which we can make an ecologically relevant indicator. And we quickly realized it's harder than we thought because one, you know, some experiments measure growth, some measure survival. Both of those things are really important for fisheries management. Uh, reductions in either one of those things um, can mean declines in uh, recruitment success and uh, harvest essentially. Um, so this is a nice figure she gave. And so, uh, for instance, this, this is cod and, uh, you know, they're relatively uh, less sensitive to aragonite saturation state. But you can see like, you know, these experiments detected reductions in their survival, um, you know, at all of these um, ranges of values. Uh, the other problem is that a lot of these um, experiments will have like two treatments and or three treatments in it. So it's difficult to determine like what, what's the threshold. Um, and then you can see also life stage is important. So we have uh, hard clam larvae here and lar hard clam adults. Um, and then also another hard clam larvae here. I think that's right. But yeah, you'll have different studies that tell you different things. I think, um, you know, our opinion is that this pteropod meta-analysis that was done by Nina Bernadskit, Bernad, because she, um, they did a really good job um, looking at all these different factors that you have to consider. Um, and so as part of our larger project, we have a set of 41 indicators. Ocean acidification is just one. And so here we've taken, sorry for the blurry quality, but we've taken two species that are of interest to New York, the longfin squid, that's actually the most um, important fishery in New York, and we've taken their threshold um, and looked at, you know, the percent of area within um, the place that we consistently monitor, and um, I believe these black dots are those thresholds for different years, and the color bars are the different seasons. Um, oh, actually, the this is the pteropods, is the black marks, and then this is the the uh, the squares are the squid, I believe. 
Um, and I will also say that in terms of, you know, how we're trying to communicate ocean acidification risk or um, state to um, New York DEC and stakeholders is uh, also difficult. Thanks, Austin. Um, and so we obviously think aragonite saturation is the most important, but we found that pH is easier to understand, like aragonite is, is you know, sounds kind of weird. And so um, when we were selecting indicators, the DEC wanted a pH indicator, but we've been pushing for aragonite indicator. And so I want to emphasize that, you know, it's a constant dialogue between um, managers and um you know, the scientists about what's what's important and also like sort of an educational process. Um, so take home points. I'm really proud that this was what, you know, was available um, for for PCO2 uh, data in the New York before, before and this is after. Um, and I mean, that's another thing that I'm dealing with now is start with data management. We thought a lot about it in the beginning, but I really think we should have hired a data management person right away. So hopefully, I don't know, with NECAN coordinating things, that can be more of a um, emphasis. And we, you know, really look at this as a long-term monitoring project. And so we want, we knew right away that we wanted to get climate quality data. That's why uh, we wanted to do the shipboard monitoring and get those discrete water samples because we felt like that was the gold standard in terms of, you know, quality of those those four parameters that you want to have. And then, uh, you know, as I was emphasizing in the last part of this talk is, you know, be flexible. We're constantly um, communicating with New York State DEC and we've tailored our monitoring program and our in indicators to meet their needs as well as trying to educate them and the broader public about, you know, why ocean acidification and aragonite in particular is, is important. So consider how, you know, you're going to go from the monitoring on up to communicating that to the public. And I will, um, I guess, pass the torch and wait for questions later. Thank you so much, Janet. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, up next, we have our last presenter, Frederick Sear. Frederick is a multidisciplinary physical oceanographer with strong research interests in physical biogeochemical interactions, ocean climate, and fisheries. He works as a research scientist for Fisheries and Oceans Canada and is based at the Northwest Atlantic Fisheries Center in St. John's, Newfoundland. He holds a Bachelor of Engineering degree in Engineering Physics, a Master of Science degree in Climate Sciences, and a PhD in Oceanography. He joined the DFO in 2017 and mainly focuses on the Northwest Atlantic Ocean climate. His research activities are strongly related to the DFO's Atlantic Zone Monitoring Program, or AZMP, which aims to provide environmental considerations in support of fishery sciences and management. Uh, please, uh, please feel free to share your screen and uh, give us your the final presentation today, from Drake. Uh, thank you, Austin. Um, all right. I guess you can see this. All right. So, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks uh, very much for the invitation. Um, so yeah, this this project is basically a little bit of the Atlantic Zone Monitoring or Monitoring Program, which is the core of my of my day to day work. Um, this presentation was prepared by myself and Olivia Gibb, who worked as a postdoc with, with us. Uh, but I'd like to acknowledge here, uh, you know, contributions from many other people from different DFO center uh, across the Atlantic. Um, so um, at, in uh, in the Maritimes, uh, people at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography. DFO in Quebec, uh, in Newfoundland, Labrador, and in the Gulf region located in New Brunswick. So it's about the, the variability of ocean parameters in the Atlantic zone. But first of all, some background. Um, so we have to, you know, think back 30 years ago, um, uh, following the, the collapse of the ground fish fisheries in, in the Northwest Atlantic. Um, 
you know, scientists started to realize that maybe we should better monitor the environment to try to, to understand what's going on. And so DFO put in place a working group to basically provide uh, a proposition for a, a monitoring program of the Northwest Atlantic. And this was published as a technical report uh, in 1998. And in the very first paragraph of the introduction, there is the sentence that changes in climate cannot be ignored as an explanation for fluctuation in marine resources. That was really the rationale to create what is known today as the Atlantic Zone Monitoring Program established in 1998. So the, or the AZMP is basically the monitoring of uh, the Newfoundland Labrador Shelf here, Scotian Shelf, Gulf of Maine, and also Gulf of St. Lawrence. Um, so as part of this, this monitoring, we monitor the physics, the biogeochemistry, and also the biology such as, you know, plankton, uh, for example. Um, all right, so um, until 2014, there was no uh, carbonate chemistry measurements as part of the AZNMP. Uh, this first changed with a proposal submitted to ACAS, which stands for uh, DFO's Aquatic uh, Climate Change Adaptation Services Program, uh, to support uh, the collection of carbonate chemistry data. So in 2014, Pepin et al. Uh, submitted a, a proposal, which was funded, about uh, delineation of ocean acidification carbonate curation state in the Atlantic zone. And the idea was to incorporate collection of current chemistry into uh, AZMP, which include pH, uh, disorganic carbon, and total alkalinity. Uh, in 2015, 2016, there was a workshop uh, throughout different DFO region in the Atlantic for the standardization of ocean acidification analysis. And then in uh, 2018, there was another ACAS proposal entitled recent changes in the biogeochemistry of the Northwest Atlantic water masses. And the idea of this proposal was to assemble all carbonate chemistry data collected as part of the AZNMP since 2014 and establish kind of a baseline for uh, ocean acidification. And this, this really is the focus of today's presentation. Uh, so my the rest of my presentation is, is mostly in two part. First part is the assembly part, and the second part is to just a quick description of the spatial temporal variability of of carbonate parameter system. Uh, so starting with the first one. So as I mentioned, so this is the what we call the Atlantic zone, uh, which is actually the Canadian Atlantic zone. Uh, so three main region: uh, Newfoundland, Labrador here in blue. Um, uh, which is monitored from uh, St. John's, Newfoundland. Uh, the Scotian Shelf here and a bit of Gulf of Maine is monitored from uh, the Maritime Region, which is located at the Bedford Institute of Oceanography in Dartmouth, uh, Nova Scotia. And uh, the Gulf of St. Lawrence here in red is monitored both by uh, the Quebec Region, located in Montjoly, and the Gulf Region, located in New Brunswick. So for all these stations, we usually measure, you know, uh, all physical data, CTD with temperature salinity. Uh, we have an oxygen sensor. We, uh, we further use the water sample to calibrate the, the oxygen. Uh, and then we have, uh, you know, total alkalinity, really water sample from the skin. So we have total alkalinity, dissolved organic carbon, pH, all nutrients, and again, dissolved organic uh, a diesel oxygen that we use to calibrate the CTD. And of course, for all carbon system, we use best practice of ocean CO2. So uh, using this parameter, we can derive further parameters um, such as uh, PCO2 and omega or saturation state of aragonite or calcite using CO2 cis. And we use a, um, a system modified for Python. Um, so basically, if you have two of the three parameters here, so TA, DIC, or pH, if you have two of them, you can derive the rest of the PCO2, omega, uh, et cetera, using TS and nutrients. Uh, and to do so, we use, uh, it's a bit technical, I'm going to skip this, but you know, we use this uh, dissociation constant from Merbach et al., et cetera. Um, so just in terms of for different regions, so the idea here is really to coordinate the sampling done by several regions. So in Newfoundland Labrador, we have three survey normally every year, spring, summer, and fall. We have discrete depths for our water sample um, here, and we do measure TA and DIC. In the maritime regions, um, they also measure TA and DIC, 
They're, they have two survey every year, spring and fall. And these are their, the discrete depths for the, the measurements. And in the Quebec and the Gulf region, they have two uh, annual surveys, spring and fall. Since the Gulf is shallower, uh, there's a focus on, on shallower depths here. Uh, and they used to measure TA and pH until 2019. But since 2019, they measure all three parameters, so TA, pH, and DIC. Uh, in, addition, in addition to the regular A's and MP survey, there are uh, ground fish surveys where they take advantage of the ground fish sampling to perform extra uh, carbonate parameters uh, sampling. And since 20, 2017 and 2022, they provide excellent coverage of the Gulf here that you, know, the, you cannot see the points, uh, I haven't put them, but basically they cover the entire Gulf of St. Lawrence. So in addition to that, we also have two uh, high frequency stations. So one uh, called Rimouski station located here, uh, sample nearly weekly uh, by the Quebec region. And in Newfoundland, we have the station 27 sample in uh, near monthly fashion, um, both of them with, uh, with carbonate data. So in the assembly part, we put all data together. So here's a kind of a subset of a, of a bigger table where all year are, are shown here, all seasons, different regions, and then all the individual trip name um, or mission names with the number of station, number of bottle, maximum depth, uh, start date, end date, and the measured parameter for these, um, during these missions. Uh, so you see some have three, uh, three parameters, most of them two, so TADIC for uh, Newfoundland and, and uh, Maritimes, and usually uh, TAPH for Quebec region or for the Gulf region. Uh, so overall, this is uh, more than 20,000 individual uh, water sample that has been converted and in a single uh, data set. So the data set is a plain, you know, comma separated value file. Um, <clears throat> there's all here, just an, an example. So all the different date dates for all the sampling from 2014, 2022, different region, you know, trip name again, um, station name and all the parameters here. Um, so this file has 23 columns, so a lot of metadata with, in addition to trip name, station name, there's latitude, longitude, the physics, temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, uh, then all nutrients, and then all derived parameters. So uh, inorganic carbon, pH, uh, omega, aragonite, calcite, PCO2, oxygen saturation, and then the, the three measured parameters. So pH in the lab with the temperature and then measured total alkalinity and, and inorganic carbon. So this data set has been published um, on the FRDR, so the Federated Research Data Repository. So there's a citation key here. So you can just go and download the entire data set. At the very moment, it's not updated up to 2022, but to 2020. But that should be done shortly. Um, and yeah, so that was the first part really to assemble all these data together, which was a task you can imagine because everybody had the, their file in different Excel sheet a bit everywhere. And the second part was really to start looking at spatial temporal uh, variability of the current system. So uh, we to do so, we prepared a manuscript. So again, Olivia prepared that. Um, over the years. Um, the manuscript was submitted uh, at the very end of 2022 uh, and appeared in, um, in the Earth System Science data in the discussion part. So that's kind of the, the journal where they put the preprint online. So you can already have a look. Uh, we received recently the, the comment from the reviewers and we prepared the resubmission. And by doing so, we updated to 2022, so very uh, very up to date right now, and we're about to resubmit it. Uh, and so, just a you know kind of uh, element from this this uh, work. Uh, first of all, the oceanographic context, which which is quite important here, and you can imagine it's a it's a huge region we're talking about, uh, and located at a confluence between Arctic, sub subarctic, and subtropical currents. So there are Arctic outflow from the from uh, Baffin Island current here and the Hudson Strait flowing along Labrador Shelf. So the color code here is the temperature, sea surface temperature, end of August, so warmest basically time of the year. We still have near zero degrees Celsius water here flowing on the shelf. 
uh, meeting warm water of the Gulf Stream. So we have this subtropical water here. And we also have uh, subpolar water coming from the West Greenland Current and becoming the Labrador Current here. So they all uh, mix together in, in the zone. And in that addition to this, we have freshwater outflow from the, from the St. Lawrence um, River and the Gulf, which uh, given its estuarine circulation is one of the biggest estuary in the world. All right, so uh, using the data we, we gathered, we were now able to do maps such as this one uh, in this specific case is total alkalinity for the fall of 2017, which was one of the season where we have the best uh, coverage throughout the, the zone. And so I'm, I'm not going to go through all, you know, description of all these, these, um, these variables. It's just to give you an example of what we can get. For example, uh, surface total alkalinity is a mirror of the surface salinity uh, because there's a pretty tight relationship between salinity and, and, and TA. Uh, for example, in the very fresh uh, estuary here, we have the, the lowest TA, etc. When we have salty, uh, salty Gulf Stream water here, we have the, the highest uh, TA. Um, you can look at DIC, for example. In this case, this is surface and bottom DIC. So uh, DIC much higher at the bottom because of all the remineralization of, uh, of organic matter especially in the estuary here. Um, <clears throat> pH, again, um, lower pH at the bottom, especially in the Gulf of St. Lawrence here, all these yellow colors, it means low pH, pretty high pH in the, in the Newfoundland region and, and offshore from Nova Scotia. And we can go, go on like that and look at all the parameters. Probably one of the easiest to understand given the color, color code here is the uh, saturation state of aragonite. Um, so everything below one, which is colored red in this case, means undersaturated, and undersaturated means that it can be corrosive for um, for organism that have a that have a, a carbonate shell. So just a quick look, we could see at surface undersaturated in the estuary and in, in the Western Gulf. At at the bottom, the entire Gulf is undersaturated, and also some area of the of the shelf here. Um, another way to look at it uh, that we can do with the data we have is to do transects along the, along the region. So in purple here or magenta, it's a transect across the, the deep Lawrence channel that, you know, crosses the, the Gulf of St. Lawrence from its head to its mouth. Uh, and given the estuarine circulation, basically water enters a depth here in the in the Laurentian Channel, which is here, and are advected. And during their journey that takes for between three and five years to reach the head, they slowly become more and more um, acidic and corrosive. So basically, this is what this, this bigger figure show. And if we do a transect the other direction here, so we have, again, we can see the, the extent of this uh, undersaturated zone in the, in the Gulf. Oh, and this here is the Laurentian channel that we see here on top. We can also, well, the, so one of the other, this is for only for one season. We can also start to look at interannual changes because we have data now from 2014 to 2022. Uh, and this is really probably the next step for us in, uh, in the region, but some preliminary result from the high frequency stations. Um, so two stations are here, station Rimouski, station 27. Blue is surface, orange is bottom. I will start with station 27. You know, a lot of variability and it's relatively well mixed and shallower, like it's 175 meter. So um, there's not much difference between surface and bottom. But at station Rimouski, where it's uh, more like 330 meters, highly stratified in the estuary, there's a big difference. And in recent years, we've seen a decline in pH in the bottom water, reaching a record low uh, in the fall of 2022 at 7.42. Uh, and oxygen also was, has been declining, as you can see here, from close to 20% over the year. So since 2020 has shifted a lot, uh, reaching the new record in last fall of, of uh, eight point, uh, well, basically just less than 9%. Um, 
So quite quite severe hypoxia. So maybe relevant for, for the audience here. Um, so we report uh, carbonate chemistry data inside our um, science advisory report. So ASNMP from all the region uh, gather every year and produce a report like that. So it talks about all the, the conditions of the zone in the previous year, um, from all the way to the phys from physics to the chemistry. And since 2019, we do include ocean acidification um, parameter inside this, these reports. And this is an example of a typical figure from this report. This is actually from the 2023 uh, ASNMP report, uh, where we, uh, we basically compare bottom, uh, bottom condition in the zone between 2017 and 2022, two years we had good coverage uh, during the spring. Uh, and we have omega aragonite here, pH and oxygen saturation. So, I mean, this figure is very complex. I, I don't wanna describe it in details. Uh, we can see um, some element, for example, there's some red dots that starts to appear here in 2022 that were, were, they were not there in 2017. So uh, basically a bit more acidification uh, in the deep area of the, of the shelf here. Uh, in the Gulf, um, you can see, for example, if you look at oxygen saturation, we see the, the reduction here in, in oxygen compared to what we had here. Um, so basically typical figure we, we present in the report and then we discuss it. So I've put some text here for, for you to, uh, to read or I can go through quickly in terms of you know which level of, of reporting we do as part of these NMP. So for example, we say that from 2017, 2022, near bottom pH in the Gulf has shown a general decline, especially in the St. Lawrence estuary reaching new record. On the Newfoundland Labrador shelf, the bottom water at some station on the Grand Banks and in the Avalon Channel were undersaturated with respect to aragonite. And similarly, some stations along the Louisbourg section, you know, near Cape Breton were also undersaturated. And then for the rest of the Gulf, we pr propose some, some range here. Uh, we also say that most water of the Gulf, including Shadower Southern Gulf, were undersaturated with respect to aragonite. And then we talk about lowest pH um, in the estuary um, with the, the new record here, and then the new record for oxygen that I already mentioned, and et cetera. So that's the kind of level of information we give throughout um, this report every year. So that's my last slide. So thank you for listening and yeah, thanks for the invitation and a big uh, thanks to all AZMP staff that makes this work possible. Thanks for the uh, amazing presentation there, Frederick. Uh, I'm now gonna hand the floor over to Dwight to uh, moderate our question and answer session with the steering committee. Yeah, thanks so much, Austin. And thanks everybody for the, uh, for the presentations. I think these are extremely informative and helpful. So I have a few of my own questions um, that I've been writing in and uh, I think there's some others, and I see some from Chris, so I'll try not to eat them, eat up all of the time <laughs> with my questions. How long do I have? I don't want to make time to go through. When does this thing end? This ends uh, in 25 minutes. So we have all a right, good. We got plenty of time. All right. So, Anne, I wanted to go back and ask you questions about, um, you know, if, if, and I'm kind of wearing my federal hat a little bit now, trying to wonder where we can best coordinate at state and local level. So, you know, you, the, you clearly point out a number of existing monitoring programs that are occurring along coastal Massachusetts. In your opinion, which of these monitoring programs is probably, or maybe there's more than one that are most ready, sort of shovel ready to kind of adopt um, a, a more uh, coordinated acidification monitoring activity. So, and I'm wondering what we can provide from the NECAN, you know, region perspective if it's technical assistance and training. Um, just your thoughts on that. Like, so are there existing monitoring programs that you think are, are better suited to uh, maybe a taken on OA? Well, I, I think it depends upon your goal. I mean, one of the goals in Massachusetts was to help the shellfish growers. And obviously there's a burgeoning aquaculture uh, business. 
And I, I think for those kind of things, the monitoring almost has to be a little bit hyper local um, because I think the big regional patterns won't necessarily help a grower um, to deal with problems that can be very local due to changes in freshwater discharge or local low oxygen events. I think um, there's a lot of coastal monitoring going on that's I think very robust. Um, as pointed out, Wells is another um, National Estuarine Research Reserve that does a lot of monitoring. There's Rapoit Bay. Um, there's a number of estuaries, Costco Bay, up and down the, the coast that have very good monitoring programs for oxygen, salinity, temperature, and in many cases, pH. So I think taking advantage of them with doing some cross calibration with DIC and alkalinity might be the way to really hone in on even improving those relationships. But I, I think from the point of view of an aquaculture system or a local shellfish grower, um, you probably need some very local information. Yeah, no, I, I think that's what we're, we're starting to see. But what we want to do is kind of lean heavily on the existing, it does sound like there is quite a bit of hyper local monitoring already in place. Although it not not you know explicitly acidification, so uh, it'd be better to leverage that existing capacity in some way. I, um, I could make an additional suggestion. I don't know if you're familiar with Ameriflux, which is a nationwide network of eddy flux chambers, uh, eddy flux towers. I should say they're not run by any particular entity, but people voluntarily post their data there, and maybe setting up a network like that with you know, where everything's standardized so people could go and harvest the data um, is another thing to think about for the Northeast. Yep. Yep. And I think, you know, the regional IOS associations might be able to serve in that similar capacity and currently do for some. Um, the other thing, so I really enjoyed your talk because uh, it looked a lot of, like a lot of the work I've done in coral reef systems, which are also metabolically dominated in terms of their carbonate chemistry dynamics. And one of the metrics that we try to evaluate in those is quantifying sort of on an annual basis, the net duration of dissolution. Um, and is this anything you've you've examined? So you kind of show the dynamics of it, but have you, it'd be interesting to look at sort of what the annual accumulated dissolution period is and if that period has maybe changes or does change or how variable is it on an on a interannual cycle inter, inter annual cycle so just curious I if you looked at perfectly that. haven't has haven't done a lot of that but i think you could see from the the first slide i one of the first slides i presented you know they, they are looking at number of hours below various ph values and below oxygen so you can sort of come up with some estimate what percentage of the time are you in a net dissolution situation whereas what percentage of the time would you possibly be in a accretion phase. But I think that is a that would be an important parameter to hone in on. Yeah, because I think I think that's where we'd you'd see subtle subtle changes along the along the margins is where you you know look on an annual basis of the accumulated stress periods. Um, which I think you know kind of gets a little bit to Janet's talk where they're looking at the changes in the volume. Uh, so I, I really like the plum estuary um, stuff that you showed. I, I'm really curious, you know, what is presently the extent of shellfish and or aquaculture activities along that aragonite saturation state gradient? Do you, do you know? Because clearly so, they must have um, all the way to the fresh water. Right. We had a, uh, we had a pH uh, postdoc look at clams through the, through the system. And as you might expect, the clams disappear once you get into that middle estuary in the park or because the, you're often most of the time below aragonite saturation. There is a new aquaculture um, enterprise that started at the base of the Rowley. And I think there's interest in other people expanding that. And there is a lot of active shell fishing in the lower reaches of the estuary. And it seems like that, that transition might offer you know, a very valuable potentially field indicator of a threshold possibly. Um, and like you said, uh, what maybe governs whether that moves 
up or down stream is probably largely related to nutrient loading. <laughs> so it'd be really neat to see how that moves on an annual basis, if at all, um, based off. Right. I, I don't want to take up too much time. Actually, one of the things that's nice about Plum Islands is not heavily nutrient loaded. What okay. happens in the middle estuary is there's a balance between um, freshwater discharge also increases uh, flushing. So yep. when you have low freshwater discharge, you have higher salinity, but lower oxygen due to less flushing. So there's kind of a balance in that middle estuary between low oxygen and salinity, or I shouldn't say a balance, a dynamic tension, I guess. Well, then, and I, I do also yeah. want to give a shout out to Chris Hunt, who's actually doing a lot looking at the various um, components to the alkalinity uh, in the system. Excellent. I think Chris has actually got a question. Chris, you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, and thanks, Ann. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Um, I was intrigued by the model that you showed. I think maybe it was Jenny Rubens, but I'm not sure. That used AOU to look at changes in omega. And I I didn't catch all the details maybe, but I think it used kind of end member mixing models of TA and DIC as well. And I was curious what your thoughts were. Do you think that that kind of model is pretty site specific, or do you think it you could apply it? I don't know regionally or, or across a few different systems, or do you think that's something you kind of have to go and measure the data first and and make a site specific model? I, th I think it might be pretty robust, and I think maybe that's one of the things. For example, the NEARS data, which is across a lot of different yeah. estuaries, could be used to do. But I think the AOU is just a proxy for net CO2 saturation. Yeah. So I, th I think it should be fairly robust. Okay. But I, yeah. It seems to me that residence time of the water mass is going to play an important role, right? So, you know, the hydrodynamics of the system might be important, but maybe that's captured by, by the utilization since if it's a, if it's a, if it's a low residence time system, then the oxygen utilization, you know, must go up. I imagine. So maybe it does hold true. Yeah, I wonder a little. I guess I wondered a little bit about the freshwater and member variability, and so depending on what salinity you're you're looking at the AOU at, that could have an impact. But um, around here, I guess maybe that's not as big a concern, at least in, in a lot of systems. But great, thank you. Cool. All right. Um, before I slide over to Janet, uh, does anybody else from the wider audience have any questions that they'd like to pose to Anne? Yeah, I, so I have a question, yeah. Hi, hi Dwight, can you hear me? Yep, uh, yeah, I we can hear you. Yes, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that you can just use temperature, salinity, pH, and the dissolved oxygen to figure out uh, what, what is going to happen for the omega saturation state. So based on my knowledge, so um, if the water so buffering capacity is different, so we, we need to just think about the DICTA or, or at least one of the carbonate chemistry parameter. Since with, with the same pH, uh, uh, the DIC and the TA levels are different in, in different water masses. So I'm wondering if you would like to include more carbonate chemistry parameter into your model prediction. I, I can't argue against measuring more of the mem or more of the parameters in the carbonate system. I guess my only point is if we're looking at having to do a lot of monitoring for aquaculture, um, it might be e it might be enough to get the simple salinity, temperature, um, oxygen, and pH, um, and then you know, once you've got those relationships down, uh, but I, I think in general, in the systems I work in, uh, background levels of alkalinity, you know, look, they track pretty closely with salinity. Thank you. Yeah, and I think this is why, you know, like Ann was suggesting, if you, if you do it in partnership with maybe a regular, perhaps quarterly or whatever, you know, discrete sampling campaign that goes out and does, you know, the full suite of carbonate chemistry in a very robust way, then you can continue to refine and, and uh, couple, you know, and refine those algorithms. And even if they are site specific, at least you're like, okay, 
at this location in this estuary, this is the one we're going to use, and we get it validated every, you know, every season. I think that might be a, a cost-effective approach to it. So, yeah, I do I appreciate the, the proxy approach. Thank you, Ann. Yeah, I'm sorry. I wanted to jump in real quick because this is a point I've been thinking about a lot. And I wanted to sort of, I guess, give a shout out to some of Sam's work. You know, Sam, your master's student, Kelly, was it Kelly McGarry, who published that paper for regional um, sort of multi-parameter uh, retrievals of carbonate system parameters, I think is really, really interesting and something I've been thinking about a lot and um, maybe trying to apply to some local systems here in the Gulf of Maine to see, you know, whether and when you get really close to the coast, whether those kinds of relationships are applicable or if you need like a site specific one for your particular area. Um, but I think they hold a lot of potential to unlock a lot of data, like Ann was saying, that's really relatively easily collected with, you know, commercial songs. So good job, Sam. <laughs> Kudos, Sam. All right, uh, Janet. So uh, yeah, really enjoyed your talk as well. Was not aware of the RV Seawolf. Um, really interested to learn more about that operation. Um, so I guess first up is I is I am this is something else I meant to ask Ian too. But I'm really keen in this particular session to kind of figure about how the data is being utilized. Who's asking for it? You provide it to them. How you package it? How they're making use of it? So. Uh, I'm, let me just go back to Ann very briefly, just ask that question. So it, it clearly you're being charged to go out, characterize these systems. Who is the state office or which, you know, is it a local organization that you're providing the information to? And do you feel that there are decision points that are being considered in light of the data you're providing? So we're a, a long-term ecological research site and we deposit our data approximately yearly in the environmental data initiative site. So it's uh, freely available to everybody. Um, at the moment, um, I wouldn't say it's being used too heavily for ocean acidification. There's much more interest in water quality and sea level rise issues. Our, our, uh, our tide gauge gets downloaded a lot more than our other data. But it's all it's all available. Okay, but there but there are who are the primary users of water quality data itself? Are those local towns? Or um, it's it's state? it's often people doing sort of regional comparisons. Um, the local towns do not usually use our water quality data. Interestingly enough. Hmm. Okay. All right. So uh, now shifting to Jan Janet. Uh, so right. Uh, back to the RV Seawolf, uh, the data maps that you're generating wasn't clear to me. So you're providing, you did say it, but who, who's making use? You're quantifying the total volume of aragonite saturation state looks like over the cold pool area. Who is, is uh, receiving that data? How is it formatted to be provided to them? And are there decision points that they're executing as a consequence of that data? So we're funded by the New York State DEC. All of the projects funded under them have a technically have a three-year um, embargo that only we are allowed to use the data, the scientists that collect them. Um, and there's a history of that, but I'm happy to provide the data to people as long as, you know, we can ensure that it's used correctly and um, you know, be credited for collecting that data. Um, the glider data has, we've been posting that, I mean, partly because it's just really easy. Um, in terms of the indicator that we've developed to, you know, the area occupied or whatever, um, that is given in a report, an annual report that's available. Um, it's, it's given to DEC and then they post it on their website. <clears throat> okay. And so it's primarily DEC that's asking for that and using it. I know um, people have used different of, you know, of the 41 or whatever indicators that we have have used um, different ones, but they have not, I haven't had anyone ask for the indicator, you know, values or anything like that, which I'd be, you know, happy to share. Um, 
but you know, all the indicators that were being developed are primarily for DEC. They're not really um, tied to a specific management objective. We tried in the beginning to you know develop an indicator system where there's an indicator and then there's a management objective. But really, you know, in talking with them, they just they just said, you know, we want to know what's going on, you know, and they want us, you know, that's part of, I guess, the education process is just they want to know what's going on in the system um, a little bit more holistically than they knew before. Um, and they are, you know, interested in ocean acidification, you know, not just um, its effects on organisms, but they are interested in the long-term decline in, in pH ocean acidification proper. Um, and so that's why, you know, we're focusing sort of the, on the long game and sure. trying to collect really high quality data and get that trend. Are there, are there other properties of, this, of the ocean that you're quantifying as part of that annual DEC report that they currently are informing policy decisions on, or is the whole report largely informational for them, independent of ocean acidification? I think it is mostly informational. They just released a, um, I forget, it's a state of the ocean report that was more widely circulated and they used some of the temperature, you know, trends that we have seen in the coastal ocean. Um, I don't think that any of the um, like fisheries management at DEC has, you know, used used any of that for like a an assessment or anything like that. Um, okay. Yeah. Nope. Uh, yeah. Nope. Just wanting to get a sense. Um, also wondering, you know, so I don't rather than taking data from you, I'm actually hoping to give you data. Okay. We have a lot of, <laughs> so, I mean, there's a fair amount of relevant data that we're collecting on the NOAA side um, that I don't know how well coordinated it is and we should probably talk more about it, but I'd love to see if there's any exercises we're you know, being engaged to do in comparisons between the COA data sets. We've got a number of surface underway data sets that transit that area on a much more high frequency rate um, then obviously ECO, which comes every four years. I don't think our ECOMON, our quarterly ECOMON surveys, they may, depending on the crews, penetrate that far, and they have full water column discrete carbonate chemistry being analyzed. Oh, okay. So we may have a number of existing data sets that may be of relevant to you that are acquired and generated at Go Ship climate quality standards. So it might be helpful to do a cross inter comparison of it. Yeah, and Boshan may be looking at that data. He's he's been you know able to do the analysis more than I have. Um, and I will say we have you know we have shared all the data, well, some of the data that's passed that three year embargo and put it on the Marco slash Maracu site. I get them confused. Um, right, okay. But you know, I'm kind of I'm finding that the glider data is really they've got a template and it's like really easy, but it's been harder. <laughs> it's you'd be surprised how hard it is to share data. And so, like I I wish I had started right away. Like this is how we're going to share it and this is how we're going to organize it, um, especially because so we, we have we, lots of different kinds of data. We do have so architectures. We, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh. Uh, no, so wait, go ahead, and then I just want to jump in afterwards. I was going to mention that we we have architectures built right now through our program, the acidification program at NOAA for for you know in, in, ingesting OA relevant data um, for the community. And you're welcome to check out our website and see if it's of benefit. It may not be, but it has a rich metadata standard, and it's largely what we use for our community. So I am really keen on the glider data sets, how they're developing. But yeah, I'm sorry, Chris, you had a question too. Well, this this leads really nicely into one of the points that um, that I wrote down when I was listening to Janet's talk. And I was really delighted, Janet, that you mentioned the sort of data management burden that comes along with a program like this, because um, it's it's both humongous and really easy to overlook when you're writing a proposal or designing a, a monitoring program. 
Um, it's something that, you know, we've been dealing with here in the at UNH, for example, we've been monitoring for a long time and the data management doesn't get any easier. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I've sort of recently been exposed to like the glider DAC program and it seems really nice and kind of a, a centralized way for different users of a, of a platform to standardize their data and share it and, and make it um, really easy to access. So do you, as we as a group are you know, tasked with coming up with a regional monitoring plan, do you have any thoughts or suggestions as to what would make that end of things either easier or more useful or both, right? Like it, like you said, at the very beginning when we're, when we're designing this effort, what would you say that we should make sure that we do so we don't get a year or two into it and realize, oh no, we're, we're like drowning in under a enormous pile of data that we can't, that's too unruly to manage. I, I, I wish we, I guess I'll just speak from personal experience, but I wish we had a person and we thought about mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. We said we should have a data manager and it's, and we said, no, you know, the different techs have different data. And so the different techs will do it because they know their data best. But I wish we had one person to just make sure it all gets done. And, you know, um, so we're, I think we're going to change that. We're going to finally hire that person that we originally should have hired um, because it's just time. Yeah. And when you're spending time collecting the data and trying to, you know, QA, QC it and um, all that, you don't have time to make sure that that actually went up to the whatever yep. Yep. thing it was supposed to. And we do that a better job of that for the indicators themselves. Um, and so we use GitHub in much the same way that the Northeast Fishery Science Center does. And so the the time series and the plots and all that stuff and how we did it is all on GitHub. And it's really easy to just get that data and um, download the code to analyze it too. So um, I, I think a dedicated person would mm -hmm. be the way I would start. And yeah, I, I too have been looking with envy at the glider deck. It just, <laughs> it seems really seamless. And Grace said yeah. something about, you know, a template. And I was yeah. like, I want a template, you know, because it took time <laughs> for us to do that. I they have an advantage in that the hardware is standardized, right? So yeah, it's, yeah. it's a lot easier than what kind of a, a build from scratch yeah. system. But no, I, I think I agree with you. And like, as someone who's done a lot of monitoring, it's very easy to focus on just keeping your sensors running and keeping that end of data acquisition good and robust. And it's really easy to push off boring stuff that nobody <laughs> gets excited about doing the QA, QC and um, submission to a data portal and all that kind of, I think, yeah, you need a person both to both to coordinate that and maybe to kind of be like the bad cop and say like, hey, I, I need your data now because it's overdue or whatever. So I think. Hey, yeah, Chris. and yeah. you don't need a carbonate chemist, you need like a data scientist, you know, it's a different kind of person that you need. Super different so skill I, sets. I just want to make sure I leave like yeah. negative 30 seconds or so mm -hmm. for uh, for Frederick's talk. And Chris, when I hand it to you, you've got a number of really excellent questions. So oh, you just keep going. But if you could I have to remind myself to, to Frederick. Oh, um, oh, so yeah, I, I think maybe Kamiko um, addressed it in the little document we're running, but Frederick, has anybody tried to look at internal consistency when three carbonate system parameters have been measured on the on the Canadian data sets? Uh, yes, actually. Again, I'm not a chemist. I'm a physical geographer. And uh, Fair enough. so um, as part of the manuscript I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, uh, we did actually in the revision try to look at the error in PCO2, for example, mm -hmm. if you calculate PCO2, depending if you have TAPH or, or TADIC, and it's actually mm -hmm. quite substantial. It was a surprise. Wow. We're talking about uh, yep. like 30% on average error. Mm -hmm. Quite, uh, I, I was, uh, you know, again, I'm not a chemist, but I was, uh, I was surprised. You, you take things for granted and finally, uh, yeah. So better to measure PCO2, for example, if you, if you can. Then for the rest, uh, derive, you know, deriving DIC, uh, if you have TAPH, is not that, 
that much of a problem, but for other like omega and for PCO2, it's a yeah quite substantial. And again, okay. it's just a, it's just a subset of the data where we have the three. Yeah. No, uh, and it's that's also great. So in, uh, in mostly from the Gulf, where it's uh, also yeah. mostly freshwater. Well, yeah, that makes sense because that's perhaps where the weirdest chemistry is going on. Yeah. Um, and so there, I've been thinking about that a lot lately. I, I think I'm coming to the conclusion that in, the closer you get to the coast, the less robust are or less internally consistent our carbonate system measurements are. Um, and I have a suspicion that maybe people know this and just don't want to admit it because they are afraid that they'll look like bad carbonate chemists. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, Makes me I feel better. I, yeah, I'm, I'm not self-conscious enough to be afraid to say like, you know, we take measurements. And I think we do a pretty good job. And sometimes we try and do internal consistency and we go, what is going on? Um, so, okay, good. I'm encouraged. I thought I, I thought I had made an error in the code to be honest. And then I, you know, looking again and yeah. Looks like it. I think, yes, that's the first place you look, but then when you double check your code and it looks right, then there's a, a broader reason that must be um, out there somewhere that's causing that internal inconsistency, I guess, um, that maybe as a community and not even just regionally, but really broadly, we need to put some more attention on. Okay, thank you very much. Chris, I think there's yeah. a CDOM and DOC measure at the same time. So mm -hmm. if you dig in, I think there is enough data mm -hmm. to dig in. So. Yeah, I think CDOM and DOC could be one thing that can really help inform that. Um, I, I think I do also think that there's a need for some really painful, really careful studies, you know, in the lab of internal consistency of meso haline carbonate chemistry um i think it's there's stuff going on we totally we still don't quite understand Shh, don't talk too loudly about it Chris. sorry right. hey, <laughs> we we've come to uh an overage of about four minutes all my fault apologies for that these are really really fantastic uh and uh thoughtful talks thank you for sharing them with the steering committee and everyone else who joined the call. So with that, I will bid you all a really fond adieu. And Here before folks. everyone goes, I just yep. want to remind everyone that our next webinar is Monday, July 31st from 1 to 2.30 at the same time. And thanks again to all the presenters. And thank you. Thanks, <laughs> you bet. Thank you.